Ladies and gentlemen, well, welcome to the LSE Faith Centre. My name is James Walters. I'm director of this centre, which opened in 2014 to promote interfaith leadership among LSE's diverse student body. Our students come here from 160 countries, and it's a sad fact of our times that many of those countries are seeing an escalation of religious, um, religion-related conflict and the suppression of rights of religious and non-religious minorities, the topic of our lecture this evening. So our team here run religious literacy and leadership programmes to build both understanding of other faiths and understanding of how religion interacts with the complex currents of today's world. And that's an agenda that will be taken further in our Religion and Global Society blog that we're launching next week and where tonight's event will feature. Our Faith and Leadership programme is generously supported by Dave and Kitty Beacon, an alumnus and his wife in Chicago. And we complement the programme with this annual lecture, first given in 2014 by Dr Georgette Bennett, founder of the Tannenbaum Centre for Interreligious Understanding. In this past year, we have used the Faith and Leadership programme as a model for our partnership with the Foreign Office to build understanding of religious issues uh, among our diplomats. So it's entirely fitting and a great honour for us that this year's speaker is Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, Minister of State for the Commonwealth and the UN at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Lord Ahmed has held various posts in government following a 20-year career in banking and finance. And since taking on his current role in the Foreign Office, he has particularly highlighted freedom of religion and belief as one of the British <coughs> government's human rights priorities around the world. Lord Ahmed is going to speak for about 30 minutes and then we should have some time for questions from the floor before he needs to go on to his next ministerial engagement around 6.30. So please turn your mobiles to silent, but do also feel free to tweet with the hashtag LSE Lord Ahmed. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, uh, Lord Ahmed, we are delighted to welcome you. Thank you. And we look forward to hearing your lecture on leading for religious freedom. Please welcome you. Well, good evening and thank you very much for that very warm welcome. I feel I should actually start with an apology, if I may, because your director, Dr Walters, has been pursuing me for months. Uh, but I would say in his usual charm, charming and most gentle manner. Um, why to allow me to come and address you, but talk about something which I feel very passionate about, which is the issue of freedom of religion and belief in the broader context of human rights as well. And I do hope by the time I've spoken and you've energised the meeting with some of your questions as well, it'll be worth waiting for. But I know for my part that perhaps since my appointment to the Foreign Office um, as Minister for, of State for the United Nations and the Commonwealth, much has happened. Indeed, if we look at recent events today and yesterday, you can imagine that back at the FCO, there's a few things keeping us quite occupied. However, the important thing is about the issues that also matter in a broader context. And I'll be touching on issues across the United Nations and the Commonwealth. Indeed, one of my responsibilities is preparing for the Heads of Government meeting, which is taking place in 32 days' time. Not that I'm doing a countdown or anything, but we're going to have 53 leaders from across the diverse family of the Commonwealth nations. And I do hope that amongst the discussions we talk about the values agenda, we'll be able to also talk within that context about the freedom of religion and belief. I'm also the Prime Minister's Special Representative on Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict. So if you couple that with the UN, the Commonwealth, Human Rights, and as the International Minister for Security, Counterterrorism, and Countering Violent Extremism, you can imagine it keeps me a tad busy. But what I'm here to really talk about is my role, and a central role, and a central key point within the government's priorities about freedom of religion and belief. And it is a policy priority for our government. Indeed, Mrs May, the Prime Minister, herself has spoken up, and I quote, for the need to stand up for the rights of people of all religions to practice their beliefs 
in peace and safety. And I want to go into a bit more detail of that in a moment or two. But first I want to help you understand what drives me. What are my personal motivations in this respect? For me, as a man of faith and a Muslim, by my religion, promoting freedom of religion or belief is a very personal priority. If one looks at who shapes you, who influences you, who are your early mentors? For me, I was fortunate to have two incredible parents. Both my father and my mother instilled in me a real notion of balance and perspective. Nothing to be taken to an extreme. And it was my mother, God bless her soul, who explained the essence of faith to me as a young boy. She taught me in very simple terms, as you do in those early ages, that faith is all about divining one's relationship between me as an individual and my maker, whatever you choose God or describe God to be. But also importantly was the second element to that. It's the relationship that I would have with my fellow human beings. And as I look around our country here in the United Kingdom, I cherish the freedoms we all enjoy. The freedoms to practice our faith in this country, just as people of all faiths can do so. Secular and humanistic, humanistic beliefs, and those with no faith, are free to do without fear or discrimination or persecution. Why? Because it's built on respect. When I got married, my best man at my wedding, someone I'd known a long time, in delivering his speech, said the following. He said, Tarek and I have known each other well over 20 years. He's an atheist. He said, during that time, he's trying to convince me of the virtues and beliefs of his faith, of Islam, and I've tried to convince him of the virtues of my faith, beer and rugby. <laughs> Neither may not have succeeded in the way we intended. However, what we have done is develop this incredible relationship and friendship. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what defines modern Britain today. I see the freedom of religion or belief, including the freedom to change religion, as a fundamental human right and one that I believe passionately about. And it's a right that should be enjoyed by everyone, everywhere. And that's why, as I was appointed a Minister of State at the Foreign Office, I was genuinely delighted, but also felt great responsibility to be appointed as a Minister with responsibility for human rights last year, and to have the opportunity to promote and defend this essential right of freedom of religion and belief around the world. The reason freedom of religion matters, although I'm sure all of you in the audience do not need for me to spell it out, it's not just for its own sake, or even because we know more than three quarters of the world are guided by their faith. It also matters because by ensuring that everyone can contribute to society as a whole is better off. There's also clear evidence to suggest that those tolerant, but let's not just set our ambition on being tolerant. Those societies which are based on respect and inclusivity are better equipped to deal with the challenges that they confront. And in this modern age, that includes the challenges of extremism. Conversely, where religious freedoms are restricted, or when legal protections for minority faiths are lacking, popular prejudices go unchecked, unchallenged. Intolerance turns to persecution. Persecution turns to violence. Violence turns to attacks. Those attacks can result in the deaths of those who are targeted. People suffer harassment, exclusion, violence, and in the worst case examples we've seen around the world, their lives are taken away. And why? Because they have a faith which differs from the majority. The overlap between promoting freedom of religion and belief and countering extremism, which as I mentioned just so happens to be another part of my portfolio, is becoming clearer all the time. So these two agendas really do come together. 
We know that religion is not the cause of terrorism or violent extremism. There's a whole range of causes. One can point to poverty, unemployment, discrimination, social or political, political inequalities, or marginalizations. But as His Holiness Pope Francis himself said in his New Year address, at times religion itself becomes the ideological justification of new forms of extremism. Problems do not arise from holding beliefs to be sacred, but from excluding and rejecting anyone who thinks differently. And let's bring it to today. My faith, the faith of Islam. Islam has been misused. Actually, that's too light a term. It has been hijacked in a way over recent decades as an inspiration for global terrorism. But the problem, as we know, over history is not just unique to Islam. We know that over time, virtually every religion has been associated with violence. Yet no religion teaches it or indeed preaches it. So it is clear that promoting respect and understanding matters for many reasons. And this is why I knew straight away when I started this role at the Foreign Office that I personally also wanted to make freedom of religion and belief a key focus of my work. I also saw it as an area where we in the United Kingdom could show real global leadership in building partnerships. Why? Because we are rightly seen across the world as a beacon of democracy, freedom and diversity. You just have to survey the British landscape today. Let's look around Britain to see some of that diversity in play. Yes, we are inspired by beautiful cathedrals and churches. Yet those spires and steeples of those great churches and cathedrals are now also found in that ever-enriched British landscapes with menorahs and min minarets, domes and temples. That is the diversity, the rich diversity, the tapestry of modern Britain today. A diversity which doesn't hold us back. It enriches us. We now have more than 1,700 mosques, 400 synagogues, 300 gurdwaras, often standing side by side with churches and cathedrals and mandirs. That's not a challenge to our society. It's about celebrating how our country promotes freedom of religion or belief. And it's not just about our diversity and our reputation for promoting equality that made me sure that we would be a credible leader, leader in this field. It was also a recognition that it's not always easy for religious minorities to integrate into another society. I know the experiences of my own family. When my father arrived from the subcontinent in the early 50s, 1953, as a young man who went to Glasgow, there's not many of this room who will know what Glasgow was like in the 50s, but my father painted a picture of a very challenging time, but he just got on with it. But one thing he learned very quickly through integration, through assimilation, through being true to your principle, he also stayed true to his faith. So whether it's in a big multicultural city like London or a tiny rural <coughs> hamlet, accepting people of a minority faith does require a shift in mindset on the part of the majority of the population as well. It's a two-way process. Integration isn't just about those who are new to a place. It's also about those who are already residing in a place. Let's look at some practical examples. When a temple is built on our streets, where a halal or kosher butcher opens in the market, it forces you, some would argue, to accept that your religion is one of the many and not the only one. I fully accept that for some this can prove difficult and the battle of ideas is by no means won, even here in the UK. But if you look around our country, that acceptance comes through education, learning about each other, and a two-way process. And as all the evidence suggests, that when people overcome their fears, their prejudices of other faiths and other people, the whole of society can move forward. The whole of a nation 
the country benefits. And I am absolutely convinced that freedom of religion and the mutual respect amongst our many different faith communities contribute directly to our strength as a nation. Look at around you in modern Britain today. Yes, there may be challenges, there may be prejudices, but when I look around the United Kingdom and I see people of different communities, of different faiths, of different cultures, excelling in every sphere and every profession of life, that makes me proud. It makes me proud of the fact that our country, notwithstanding challenges, has achieved so much. Quintessentially, we often talk about cricket as the quintessentially mm -hmm. example of what defines England. Yet when you look at the England cricket team today, you see a man with a long beard who is not feared. <coughs> he is celebrated, celebrated by people on the terrace who may have the same looking beard or be not to mimic him, but to celebrate him. Why? Because our country brings us together. We celebrate our diversity. We recognize the contribution of people of all communities, all cultures, all faiths. That defines modern Britain today. Of course, we're not alone in this. In the Middle East, Lebanon stands as a model of coexistence. And I'm encouraged by recent developments in Abu Dhabi, a third Christian cathedral for the Greek Orthodox faith has just opened and a mosque beside the Catholic Cathedral, which had carried the name of the Crown Prince, has just been renamed at his request, the Mary Mother of Jesus Mosque. Outside the Middle East, I saw religious diversity flourishing in Ghana when I visited last year. And I talked earlier about the drivers of extremism. When I went to Ghana, and this is how <coughs> partnership works, this is how we learn from each other, did I see lack of social mobility amongst the youth? Yes. Did I see unemployment amongst the youth? Yes. Did I see poverty amongst the youth and the communities of Ghana? Yes. But what I didn't see was extremism or the challenge that extremism poses to its youth. The question I had as a visiting minister from the United Kingdom was why? Notwithstanding those issues, what worked? It was because the faith communities, the diverse faith communities, Christian and Muslim in the main, came together to advise the government to work for the good of that country, not on the basis of their differences, but on the basis of what unites them. Far too many states, for too often, look towards their divisive nature. And focusing on that, whilst I've talked of the positive, tragically, as we look around the world, millions of people face appalling persecution every day. Why? Because of their religion or belief. And right here in Europe, where we have some of the strongest equal rights protections in the world, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are on the rise and must be dealt with robustly. I was greatly saddened to learn of, many of you will know of that recent letter asking people to take up arms against the Muslim communities of Britain. So therefore the job has not been done even on our domestic soil. Further afield, we have been horrified by the barbarity of Daesh in Iraq and Syria towards Christians, Yazidis, Mandians and others. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, I just returned from Iraq last week. I had the opportunity to visit Mosul historically a beautiful town. No longer could it be categorized as such. Devastated not once, but twice, and most recently by that very despicable organization, Daesh. And in my capacity as the special representative of the Prime Minister on preventing sexual violence, I met directly with some of the victims, the survivors of that very conflict. Those women, who saw their young daughters, often aged below six and five and four, not just being maimed and tortured, but being raped and killed. And those same daughters, then, if they survived their ordeal, had to watch their mothers go through that same ordeal again. And why? As one lady in the camp that I visited said to me, 
simply so because we were Yazidi. Is that what religion teaches? Of course not. But tragically, those who are hijacking faith, those who take faith and erroneously present a perverse narrative, commit such inhumane actions. We have equally been shocked by Boko Haram's atrocities against Nigerian Christians, and these acts by terrorist organizations are appalling. But let's be clear, it's not just non-state actors. Far too many states endorse these practices and are failing to stand up to prevent religious discrimination or even to ensure the rights of citizens of all faiths and beliefs and none. The rights should be protected by the law. In Egypt, Coptic Christians still do not enjoy equal citizenship rights. They continue to face social pressures that restricts their freedom of worship, build churches and play a full role in nat national life. In some cases, states are going further than that and are themselves actively trampling on their citizens' rights. A reality, of course, that we've seen for the Rohingya Muslims in Burma's Rakhine state. And let's not forget the long-suffering Baha'is in Iran and the Jehovah Witnesses in Russia. In China, where there are many Christians and many people in the UK associate themselves, churches must be approved by the state, state or risk demolition. In Saudi Arabia, non-Muslim religions are banned and the death penalty is imposed for apostasy. Whilst in Pakistan, blasphemy laws are used to intimidate atheists, Christians and other minorities. And the state itself in Pakistan turns a blind eye to attacks on Christians and Ahmadi Muslims. All are being failed by the very people, governments, the states themselves, the nations, who are there, whose primary responsibility is to protect them. Christian persecution does not, do, Christian persecution is also not to be underestimated. Indeed, it is on the rise. The latest report by the Aid to the Church in Need found the plight of Christians had worsened in nearly all the countries it had been reviewed, including North Korea and Nigeria. These findings are supported by Open Doors, whose 2018 watch list indicates that one in 12 Christians have experienced persecution. And last year around the world, more than 3,000 Christians were killed. 15,000 Christian buildings were attacked. These, ladies and gentlemen, are appalling statistics. And behind every statistic lies a human tragedy. But the UK is also, let me assure you, taking action in a number of different ways to promote, defend the freedom of religion or belief. First of all, we work with governments directly, bilaterally, about specific cases. We urge them to protect the rights of their citizens. And where appropriate, we press them to change legislation that discriminates against minority communities or to introduce safeguards to prevent the misuse of certain laws. You know, when I visited different parts of the world, as I've had the good fortune to do, I went to Bangladesh and I saw progress in some respects between different Muslim communities. In Ghana, I've already talked of that experience, but I also saw that in other places in the Caribbean. But notwithstanding even those countries where a semblance of religious tolerance has been achieved. The intolerance lies just beneath the surface. And therefore it's important we work with international partners. And I'm looking forward to meeting the US ambassador at large for international freedom, religion, uh, amongst others. And we will also and continue to work through the United Nations and other bodies to promote religious freedom, build consensus on the importance of the issue and just as importantly, to ensure the religious persecution does not go unpunished. We ourselves in the UK, as the Human Rights Minister, focus on 30 human rights priority countries where we feel we have the greatest influence. I review these personally. We selected many due to the concerns over restrictions on religious freedoms, and I have proactively raised concerns directly in the United Nations, especially at the Human Rights Council. And we have been at the forefront from the UK to bring Daesh to justice, committing £1 million to help establish a UN-led investigative team to support the collection of evidence in Iraq. And thirdly, we spend millions of pounds every year on grassroots projects around the world. Why? Simply 
because we believe that it's right to counter hate speech, to promote tolerance of minorities, and importantly build mutual respect between communities. And in addition to these three strands of activity, we have also been taking a leading role in efforts to build international understanding of related issues, such as the causes of religiously motivated violence. Last month, I was in Rome. The discussion was with scholars drawn from both Christian and Muslim communities, civil society groups, government representatives, experts on religion, on looking and exploring how the UK, hand in glove with other governments, can improve our policy response to fighting violent extremism. I was also fortunate to be granted an audience with His Holiness Pope Francis, which I regard as an extraordinary honour. His Holiness said that violence was, and I quote, the negation of every authentic religious expression. And he continued to say it must be condemned by all, and especially by genuinely religious persons. The UK's leadership in co convening events like this really, I assure you, is helping to shape understanding on all these key, key issues. It's not the first time we've done this. The UK has shown leadership in this space back in 2016 by bringing together experts, human rights defenders, experts in religion in a conference in London. But what is becoming ever clearer is that thanks to these conferences and other means of developing our ideas, is that we are together standing firm in tackling religiously motivated violence. But in doing so, we need to have a deeper understanding of the motivations which lie behind them. For example, although many say that overall religious ideas play on only a relatively small part in violent extremism, evidence shows they are vital in attracting and retaining the most violent recruits. Religious ideology also appears to be more important to non-religious recruits after they join. Many violent extremists see themselves as warriors for social justice. How ironic. And as His Holiness, the Pope himself has said, they use religious language to express a revolutionary agenda. Daesh has been particularly successful in attracting young people, especially those with some kind of vulnerability, who have no family or social structures to protect them, and who are searching for a sense of belonging, a sense of identity. Daesh's promise of, bluntly if I may, sex, salaries and moral certainty managed to attract more than 40,000, 40,000 foreigners from over 110 countries. A shocking statistic. The way it was achieved was unprecedented. At one point, some of you may have followed this, but Daesh was producing 50 videos a week, often loaded onto social media. And it wasn't in one language, it was in over 20 languages. In a vast global mobilization campaign that at first look took the world by a surprise. But I am pleased to say that thanks to groundbreaking work of the counter Daesh communication cell, which is based in the Foreign Office, Daesh no longer dominates the information space in the way it once did, and its propaganda capabilities have been severely degraded. But that is a topic perhaps for another lecture. What is clear is that the battle of ideas is far from won. I saw that directly when I visited Iraq. And though we may be beating Daesh on the battlefield and pushing them out of their geographical, physical heartlands, to win the battle of ideas, we need to both understand the ideology and the motivations to change how we can think and how we can work with communities, how we can work with each other to affect that change. I believe that at, at least part of the answer lies in making more space for religion in public life. Unlike a previous Prime Minister, this government does God. We believe that religion is a force for good. Beliefs play an important part in shaping people's identities. This ref is reflected in British society, which is becoming more and more secular. More than half the population now describe themselves as having no religion. But just because our society is becoming more secular, it does not mean that religion should be removed from our public discourse, particularly when so many individuals, communities, societies, as I illustrated through the example of looking across the British landscape today, in other parts of the world and in the UK, are guided by their faith. 
it leaves us at a disadvantage, I believe, when it comes to understanding and relating to their guiding principles, particularly those in other parts of the world. The Archbishop of Westminster, Cardinal Vincent Nichols, spoke powerfully about this last month in Oxford, reminding us of the message of Pope Benedict speaking in Westminster Hall in 2010. If I may summarise, he said that faith and reason complete each other. Faith gives moral bearings to politics, whilst reason prevents faith from becoming extreme. I think he's absolutely right, and faith itself could make a real difference to tackling extremism. The lens which is put up to now, we have to look at the issue through a solely secular lens, which has inevitably led us to secular solutions, focusing only on the economic, social or political aspects. If we instead look at extremism as at least part of an ideological issue, it sets a different framework for tackling it by making it clear that addressing extremist theology and the conditions that allow those ideas to attract followers is a key part of that solution. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, this requires a shift in the mindset on the part of governments, of policy makers, but it's a shift we are determined to make. It is one of the reasons why we ask the LSE to help us train our diplomats around the world in the importance of religious literacy of all faiths. So there are changes we can make in our policy approach, but at the same time, in order to prevent intolerance and radicalization happening in the first place, we must work from the ground up in our societies to instill in people an understanding that people of other religions, other communities, other cultures and faiths deserve to be treated equally and with respect and dignity. In this respect, education is crucial. It is vital. In the words of Mahatma Mohandas Gandhi, who said, if we are to respect others, religions as we would have them respect our own, a friendly study of the world's religions is a sacred duty. We must educate our children to understand other religions and to realize the followers of other religions are not to be feared in the hope that the next generation will be wiser than those that have come before it. All schools can play a crucial role, including faith schools. You know, I myself went to a school called Holy Trinity. Well, you don't get much more Christian than that. Did it make me more of a Christian or less of a Muslim? No. It was the ethos of the school. It's what that school taught. And indeed, it was that learning, that experience. And the vitality and the richness and the diversity of the UK today. I have three children. Two go to a Catholic school. One goes to a Church of England nursery. And as my son Mansoor said, at school, Daddy, we talked about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I said to my teacher, and when I go home, I say, Allahu Akbar. And we learn from our own experiences, as I did. <clears throat> the crucial thing is that schools should teach inclusivity and mutual respect. That is the key to a tolerant and peaceful society. And if I may, sometimes, you know, we, we, we talk about contradictions, conflicts, different identities. I have a particular identity. I'm from Wimbledon. Um, it's a bit of a giveaway when it says Lord Ahmed or Wimbledon on your title. But there are other you know, identities that enrich us. I'm proud of my heritage. You know, my, I myself, my parents were born in India, in my mother's case moved to Pakistan, then came to Scotland, and I was born in England. My wife of Pakistani heritage grew up in Australia. What does that show you? It's the diversity of our country. And that's what brings people together. I don't stand in front of the mirror, slap one cheek for being Muslim and another for being a Brit. I don't feel self-conflicted. My identities <clears throat> define who I am. They complement each other. And that's the richness of our society, of our country. And therefore, we need to encourage and support re religious scholarship. The LSE's Faith Centre indeed is a great example of what can be done at university level. When I was at school, at that Church of England school, at Holy Trinity, I returned home one day rather confused. Some would argue that I remain confused to this day, but that's another matter as well, so that's the third lecture that we may come back from. But why was I confused? There I was, a young Muslim boy of eight or nine, 
going to a school, as I've already alluded, called, alluded to, Holy Trinity, a Christian school, Church of England school. We were learning about Judaism. I was quite confused. So as I came home, I asked my mother, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Here I am, a Muslim, in a Christian school, learning about Judaism. She sat me down and said, Tarek, sit down. Gave me something to eat, as all good mothers do, because they know to help a child understand, you've got to give him or her something to eat first. And then she said to me, you know what, Tarek, when we build a house, what do we do? We lay the foundations to a house. I got that as an eight, nine-year-old. She said, after we've done the foundations, we build the walls. Got that. That was a simple analogy for me as well. And she goes, once we've done that, we put the roof onto the house to complete that house. Totally got it. She said, in the same way as Muslims, we believe the foundations of our faith of Islam is Judaism. Without the foundations of Judaism, the walls of Christianity could not have been erected. And without the walls of Christianity, the roof of that house could not have been completed. And from our perspective, that roof is Islam. And therein completes the house of Abraham. The other windows and doors represent other faiths and beliefs and a reminder to each and every one of us that we must look outwards and inwards if we are to develop that one community approach. That analogy of the house defines who I am today. It defines why I feel passionate about the importance of inclusivity when it comes to religion and belief. Turning to the Rome Conference, Islam was the point that we discussed quite extensively. Sources of traditional Islamic guidance, some argued, have not kept pace with extremist propaganda. In Western countries, Muslim populations are growing, but universities offer limited opportunities for the study of Islam from a religious perspective, or that or allows Islam to be studied in the context of today's society. So we must specifically encourage Islamic scholarship, including the exploration of key issues, such as how to live as a Muslim in a non-Muslim country, how to guarantee equal citizenship for non-Muslims in Muslim majority countries, how Muslims reconcile citizenship with the global concept of Ummah, concepts like jihad and the true definition of jihad. Is it about holy wars or the true definition, which is one of self-reformation? That is why we are supporting a program organized by the ambassador in Cairo to bring Al-Azhar scholars, amongst others, to study right here in the UK. Now, I mention that because too often we're told about conflicts, Islam against the West. What kind of conflict is that? I'm Muslim. I'm of the West. So let's put these false notions to rest because religion, whatever that religion may be, is universal. We were having a discussion a few moments ago. When I was in the US, I was talking to a group of people and I was talking about the prophet from the Middle East. Someone got a tad hot under the collar and objected to the fact that I kept on referring to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I reminded the gentleman I hadn't referred to the noble prophet Muhammad at any time. And indeed, the references I was giving was of another prophet from the Middle East, Prophet Jesus. He didn't, he's, he stopped talking after that. <laughs> but again, it shows the universality of religion and communities. So therefore, we must not just encourage interfaith dialogue, which is important. We must allow communities and faiths to come together and allow religious leaders themselves to work with governments. Governments can't do this job on our own. We need to work with the religious community, civil societies. And that's why the UK government is strengthening our links with faith groups. I have introduced regular faith roundtables, not just to talk about religion in itself. Let's talk about some of the main policy issues. I mentioned the Rohingya Muslim community earlier. That was one of the topics of the faith communities. And we had representatives of all faiths, including the Buddhist community of the UK there as well. Why? Because it was important to reflect on the true nature of Buddhist teachings, not the violence, the extremism, the terror which is being invoked on the Rohingya community 
by some who claim to follow that faith. Therefore, religious leaders play a hugely valuable role in providing moral guidance to their societies. But practical solutions, I believe, can be found if we work together with faith communities and can be incredibly influential in changing attitudes within their own communities. And I pay tribute at this point to a colleague of mine in the House of Lords, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, for all he does to reach out across religious divides and call for compassion and understanding. I might also add that for all the debate that has surrounded about a recent visit, some of you may have followed by Crown, bin, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, I should think we should also take encouragement. You know, I often say when I look at some of the challenges that I'm confronted with or some of the issues in life, it's always important to throw a lens of positivity, even if those steps from our perspective may be small steps to begin with. And in that respect, I learned from the visiting delegation about their Vision 2030 program. And I was encouraged by the fact that the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, on his way to the United Kingdom, visited the Coptic Cathedral and met with the Pope there in Egypt en route to London. Now, this was scarcely reported in this country, yet I believe it was a significant public gesture from an influential figure and a real sign that he himself, in my view, recognizes that faith leaders together, working together, have a role to play. It shows that religion itself can be part of the solution. As Pope Francis said during his visit to Burma last year, religious differences need not be a source of division and distrust, but rather a force for unity, forgiveness, tolerance, and wise nation building. We need to reclaim the ground that has been hijacked by extremists and restore respect for religion and belief. And whether we are Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Sikh, Hindu, or whatever faith or those of no faith, our beliefs act as a positive force in people's lives. And together, united, we can defeat those voices that seek to divide us. This positive force can, be help, can help to ensure that people of all faiths and none, all beliefs and none, truly feel part of that wider community. I know there is a community outreach component to your work here at the LSE, and this is immensely valuable, because whilst governments can do a great deal, tackling intolerance is not just about government action, as I said. You may have heard that on Christmas Day last year, when we looked to our communities, Christian restaurant owners across the UK opened their doors to feed the lonely and the homeless. Young people from my own Muslim community in my hometown of Wimbledon spent New Year's Day picking up litter. Earlier this year in North London, the local Jewish community raised thousands of pounds for the family of a murdered Asian shopkeeper. Now, these may be regarded as small acts of compassion, but they are great strengths. These demonstrate the true human qualities we all possess. These demonstrate that we are all part of that same community. They dispel those misconceptions and prejudice and build lasting bonds. And if I may, before I conclude, it would be remiss of me not to mention the Commonwealth. And this is my bit to sort of plug the Commonwealth as well. As I said, in just over a month from now, 53 nations from across the world, their leaders will meet here in London. And earlier this week, faith leaders were very much in evidence in Westminster Abbey on Monday for Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Day service. Indeed, if I reflect on it, I was there. It was one of those moments that was great for me because it was on the, I actually sat back and did nothing but listen, <laughs> which you have all done admirably for the last half an hour or so. But it must have been one of the biggest ever interfaith gatherings. It was a Christian-led service, yes, but we had poetry from a Sikh poet. And we had prayers from Baha'is, from Zoroastrians, from Muslims, Indeed, every faith represented here in the UK. It was a great prelude to the Commonwealth Summit that we will be hosting here. And we want that summit to be a real milestone in the Commonwealth's history. Our ambition is to rejuvenate this organisation, to make it fit for the 21st century. It has important work, done important work in the past, 
supporting countries realize their transition to independence and helping them build free and democratic institutions. We think it has great potential to do more in the future because of its scale, its diversity, its global reach. It's phenomenal when you look at some of the stats. 60% of the Commonwealth is under 30. When you travel to certain parts of, that wor of the world, it becomes even higher. I was in Gambia, the latest country to join the Commonwealth a few weeks back. Their under 30 population is in excess of 72%. But for it to realize its undoubted potential, the Commonwealth needs to have a clear purpose and one that is supported by all of its 53 member states. The summit's theme is towards a common future, and that's why there will be four clear priorities on which we agree a way forward. How to build a future that is prosperous, more secure, more sustainable, and more just. And on that final pillar, if I may, freedom of religion or belief falls squarely under that fourth pillar. Building a fairer future by promoting the values of democracy, freedom, and good governance. And we in the UK consider the promotion and protection of human rights to be of central importance. That is why we are encouraging our partner member states to uphold those values enshrined in the Commonwealth Charter, including freedom of religion, expression, the rule of law, and opposition to all forms of discrimination. And I'm therefore looking forward to working with our Commonwealth partners in effecting that change. If I may, I conclude by saying that freedom of religion or belief is, in my view, more important than ever. We know for a fact, as I said at the start, that diverse, plural and inclusive societies are stronger, fairer and more stable. To build and protect these plural societies, we need to enhance our understanding of other faiths, boosting religious literacy at all levels and by making space for religion in public life. We need to keep on making the argument that we have nothing to fear from accepting other people of other faiths, of other communities, of other cultures into our society. That mutual respect is not a weakness, it's a sign of strength. And that when faiths come together and they take that step forward, instead of those who seek to use faith to attack each other, rather they come together together in unity and start defending each other's rights. They are spreading that very universal message of not just tolerance, but of respect, compassion, and peace. A small story to end, if I may. As was said in the introduction, I used to be in the city of London for 20 years before I entered the world of politics. Some argue that going from being a banker to being a politician really means that I'm after trouble, you know, one profession perhaps <laughs> to another, which is perhaps not recognized with equal uh, respect or love in people's hearts. But that's by the by. I was sitting one day in my office and Eid, Eid al Adha, Adhya was open, uh, approaching, which is the second Eid in the Muslim calendar. And I went into my CEO's office that was next door to mine. And he's Jewish by faith, and he, how can I best describe him? He's a kind of Lord Sugar type character and a passionate, like Lord Sugar, Tottenham supporter. And I said to him, Michael, I'm not in tomorrow. It's Eid. Initially, he didn't say anything. Then he went, no, hold on, mate. <laughs> you had Eid a few weeks back. <laughs> You're pulling a fast one, mate. And I said, actually, I'm not. And he goes, okay, tell me about this Eid. And I said, well, you know the story of sacrifice? And he goes, what story of sacrifice? I said, the story of Prophet Abraham and his son. He goes, yeah, Abraham, we, we, we believe in him. I'm Jewish, I believe in Prophet Abraham. And he goes, story of sacrifice? I said, you know where God asked Prophet Abraham to sacrifice his son and in obedience to God? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah I get all of that. Then he looked at me and he goes, which son? <laughs> and I went, Ishmael. He went, no, 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 no. Us, the Jewish people believe it's Isaac. He said, hold on a minute. He then dialed the phone to our finance director, a very diligent man, um, who's a practicing Christian. And he said, Rob, come into the room. I'm with Tarek. We've got something important to talk about. Being the ever diligent finance director, 
He appeared, files in hand, ready to have a deep discussion about the future strategy of our company. Michael said to him, Prophet Abraham, you lot believe in him as well, don't you? And he goes, yes, we do. And he goes, story of sacrifice, that particular story, you believe in? He goes, yes, yes, we believe in that. Then he looked Robert straight in the eye and he said, which son? Isaac or Ishmael? Robert, being a practicing Christian, said it was Isaac. Michael smiled broadly, looked at me, and he said, Tarek, mate, we live in a democracy, two to one. We're right, we're wrong. But it's that essence, that beauty, that diversity of faith and community that defines who we are. So let me assure you, wherever I go in the world, that is the argument, and that is why I believe in the freedom of religion and belief. And whether it's at home or abroad, because, yes, I do aspire, I do have an ambition, and I do have a hope and a prayer that in the not too distant future, people of all faiths, and indeed none, as Steve and I do, may live side by side in peace and harmony. Thank you. sharing something that's both um, global in scope, as we would expect, but also very personal. We really appreciate that. And uh, I'm sure it stimulated lots of thoughts and questions in the audience. We have limited time for questions, so I would ask you to put your question in the form of a question uh, and not a, a, a great discourse that I'll have to cut off. Um, if you ask a question, could you please say your name? Uh, and if you're a student here, please tell us what you're studying. Uh, if you're not a student at LSE, perhaps you have some other affiliation that you'd like to share. Um, and we'll begin here. Thank you very much, Lord My question is, how do you move from understanding to respect and then to trust? Oh, very quickly, if I'm, I think I'm mic'd up anyway, but the simple answer to that is education. I talked about education, whether it's through schools or as we've I demonstrated and explained, from us at the Foreign Office through our diplomatic academy with our own diplomats. I think education is the essence. And there's a saying of my own faith of Prophet Muhammad, there I am now quoting Prophet Muhammad, who said, from cradle to grave, one must seek to thirst after knowledge. And I think that's a good starting point. And I think as long as we are educating ourselves, and it's not just about educating the children, I think we will not only just respect, but move to the exact basis that you've just highlighted. Rachel. Um, thank you so much for being here and speaking with us. My name is Rachel Rogers, and I'm doing my master's in international relations here at the LSE. Something that you touched on a bit but didn't really explicitly highlight in your talk was the that although there is a certain universality among religions, there also are very important fundamental differences between different faith traditions. And whereas Christianity, Judaism, and Islam especially do share some really important aspects, there are some other religions and some other religious minorities that aren't quite as similar in terms of both how they express their faith and what their core beliefs are. So in your work trying to protect those minorities, what steps do you take to try to be sensitive to how given your background and also the UK's general paradigm that may not coincide quite as much with what their system of belief is and how they express themselves in terms of their faith? Well, I think it's, it's a very good point, but I think the essence starting point must be, I mean, belief, as I said, it's not just about religion, and that's why we stress and or belief. So that belief can stem from whatever belief system someone may have. But I think any belief system has to be based on mutual respect, that understanding that the cultural or the basis or the foundations of any particular belief system, in my view, emanate from the same single source. So if we define any faith, it's a kind of embarking on a different sort of route or different journey. I mean, from my own shaping of my own thinking, if I may, um, within my own Muslim community, the Amdi Muslim community that I belong to, um, one of, at that time, the leader of that particular community was asked a question by a Christian in the audience. He said, Sir, Your Holiness, I'm a Christian, you're a Muslim, you believe Christianity is wrong and Islam is right. And he said, No, I don't what gives you that example and he put something again very poignantly as a 
sort of simple way. He didn't use religious scripture or anything. He said to the gentleman who asked the question, do you know what the M25 is? Now, suddenly asking a religious scholar of that eminence and that personality, it was, yes, I do know. It's the motorway that goes around London. He said, fine. Now, do you know what the M1 is? And he went, yes, it's a motorway from London up to Yorkshire. He goes, now, do you know what the A1 is? He said, yes, it's another route from London up to Yorkshire. And he goes, and then we have B roads and country roads. And he went, yes. And he said, well, that's what religion or belief is, that our starting point and end point is the same, but we un undertake different routes and different routes that we follow. But the end point is the same. Do you understand? He goes, now, as a Muslim, I may believe I'm on the M1 and you're on a country lane, but you're totally entitled as a Christian or of any other religion to believe that you're on the M1 and I'm on the country lanes. And that's what faith, every faith and belief teaches you. The chap who had asked the question totally got it, that we undertake different routes and different journeys. And that's how we must define that understanding. But there's a final twist to that um, from His Holiness's comments. So he said, do you totally get it? And he goes, yes, sir, I totally understand the essence of it. He goes, what's the most important thing? So the chap looked a bit confused, and he said, sorry, Your Holiness, I don't understand. He goes, the important thing is we're all going to end up in Yorkshire. But, <laughs> they... <laughs> but the point was about different routes and different journeys. And if I think, excuse me, if that's the basis of your religion and belief system and starting point in how you deal with others, then we'll be a long way to actually very much meeting the expectation you talked about. Thank you very much. Uh, very inspiring words. My name is Hakeem Horton. I'm an MSc Global Politics student here at the LSE. I just wanted to ask you, how would you respond to criticism of the faith community regarding it promoting homophobia and intolerance to um, the LGBT community? Because obviously that can create a lot of tension. It's kind of Thank you. I think when you approach any faith community or any faith system or any faith belief and ideology, again, that word I would use is one of respect. But that respect is not just in your discourse with that particular faith leader or community. It's what it should also be expected from that faith leader and community itself. If we take extreme examples, you know, throwing people off the top of buildings, off the top of buildings as the Aish did or whatever in the name of a religion. No religion sanctions that. And in approaching sensitive subjects such as LGBT rights, it's important to bridge that gap by saying, what are the rights of every individual? What are the human rights of every individual? What are the citizens' rights of every individual? And then you begin to see progress. You must throw the lens of equality, justice, and human rights on those particular sensitive issues. And you do genuinely see resonance and progress from those very faith leaders. So it's not about disrespecting faiths. It's not about disrespecting those principles. But it's also about using the very principles of that faith to show that there can be equity and justice, particularly in the context of human and civil rights for all communities. Come to this lady in the second row here. I think you were pointing one was my official, and I thought if she's got a question for me, that's going to be a double challenge. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Sharon Jitajit Singh, um, British chapter, International Association for Religious Freedom, there are four of us here. Um, you have spoken very eloquently of the need for education in order to create an environment in which we can all live in peace over a period of time. I think. My concern is that, and I'm talking religious literacy in relation to schools, more and more schools are becoming more or less independent academies and things like that. And they do not need to have religious education. So religious literacy from the children's level to university level, there is a whole gap emerging. How can that be done? Well, I think your point on religious literacy is well made. And that's, I come back to one of my earlier answers. I think education isn't just about within the context of schools but it's across all societies, and I think that's important. My own view on this is very clear. I think the teaching, we have some faith schools set up, so I pointed 
to the fact that, you know, I tell, send my children, two of them go to a Catholic school, one goes to a Church of England school. I was asked when I was over in the Vatican by uh, one of the ambassadors who was from a Muslim country, why are you as a Muslim sending your children to Catholic schools or to church? I said, well, first of all, as a parent, they're good schools. Secondly, they're local schools. You know, these are obvious things. People sometimes forget, you know, we, we have normal lives. I said, the third thing is about ethos. It's about understanding that what's being taught in the context it's being taught and how it's being taught is something that resonates with me. And I'm also confident of my own faith confident of my own principles to actually send my children to such school not because I feel they will change their faith but because I believe in the strength of my own beliefs and the respect of those faiths and I think therefore I think there's a real need and requirement within society to teach religion but teach religion in a very objective non-critical manner and I've had various discussions for example the Church of England has established schools for you know a very long time across the UK. There are other more recent communities, such as the Muslim community, the Sikh community, Hindu community, who are establishing faith schools now. I think there is a real discourse to be had, not from state to a particular faith community, but faith community to faith community, for, say, the Christian, the Church of England schools and the Catholic schools to share their experiences, how they got to where they are today, whereby they are of a particular ethos or faith, but their ability to teach religious education of other faiths and other beliefs, but doing so in a non-critical and objective manner. And I think that has to be the essence of what's being taught. But I agree with you that lack of teaching and the lack of education and understanding of other faiths leads to a big vacuum, and that vacuum is then occupied at best by ignorance, often by fear, and in its worst case by hatred. And I think that's the challenge we're facing. We're getting close. Do do Time for one more question. Yeah, do one, one more quick question. More question. Uh, yes. Um, hi, um, uh, I'm Leon. I study political economy of Europe here, also related to the topic. Um, thank you very much as well. I wanted to ask. You're going to ask me about Brexit, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to get my question, standard question about Brexit. <laughs> so go on. Something else. Um, <laughs> what do you think are the prospects for religious um, freedom in Britain and perhaps Europe as a whole? Um, and in particular, what do you think is the main challenge to it? Well, I think religious freedom and in, across Britain in particular, and I can talk about that, I think we do see religious freedom. We do see um, diversity of faith and people practicing. You know, I, you know, I'm fast approaching that sort of big, again, you know, I'll let you guess how old I am. <laughs> but I, I'm getting, and in my own lifetime, I've seen religious identity in my own community for Muslims in Britain, but also for other communities, the Jewish community, the Sikh community, the Hindu community. That religious identity is much stronger. There are more Muslim women who wear hijabs. There are more, more Sikh men who now wear turbans. There are more Jewish men who wear kappas, so on and so forth. And that I celebrate by the fact that we have created an environment, a society, where that religious identity is not just something you feel for yourself, you actually can demonstrably show it in society and it's celebrated and it's recognized. And I think that's a positive to be had. With that comes challenges because there are extremities that you face. I pointed to the example most recently of this hate letter which is circulating. But, you know, we see if the evidence rising of rising Islamophobia, uh, Islamophobia rising uh, anti-Semitism and indeed other communities because of ignorance. For example, the Sikh community being picked on because some ignorant person thinks that they're, they're Muslim. You know, that kind of identity link. It sounds, oh, how could someone do that? But that's the level of ignorance. Again, coming back to education. But I think religious freedom in itself, the ability, what is religious freedom? The ability to profess, practice, propagate, and change your faith. Does my country, our country in the UK, allow for that? Does it protect it? Yes. Does it promote it? Yes. Is it something which is more strengthened today than it was 50 years ago? Yes. So we must work collectively to protect that. Across Europe as well, I think that's very much in evidence. I think the real challenge to religious freedom is coming from the rising tide of extreme right uh, mentality and the political right. We've seen it here in the UK, but more so troublingly across the continent. And that's where I think our shared experiences, but having faith communities at the centre and heart of defining policy, working with government, 
in defining policy is going to be important because a lot of that hate, a lot of that extremist sentiment is often based not because of what they've experienced themselves, because of certain images they may have seen of particular communities, certain percep perceptions which may exist, and often out of ignorance and fear. And the best way to deal with ignorance and fear is through education. Thank you. I think it's very important that the issues we've heard about this evening are discussed more widely uh, in society. We'll certainly be making this evening's lecture available as a podcast on our website. And we'll be sharing it through social media. So do please share that with others uh, and use it as a, as a resource. So it just remains for me to thank you all for coming and for participating uh, in tonight's lecture. But most of all, to thank Lord Ahmed, first for his inspiring lecture, but secondly and importantly for championing this crucial issue uh, around the world and on the behalf of so many minorities. Thank you very much. Thank you.